We'll pick up in verse 7 tonight uh, here in Romans chapter 15 and a study that I've entitled The Heart of Ministry. You know, sometimes people ask me, you know, what's this ministry thing all about? What is it that when we say the word ministry, what is it that we mean? And we're going to dig into that deeply because the Apostle Paul, really as he's leaving his time in ministering to the church at Rome, kind of leaves them with some instruction about what ministry looks like from his perspective. And ministry is important because whether you realize it or not, you're all in the ministry. Every person in here who knows the Lord and loves the Lord uh, has been saved by grace and through faith. Every last person in here is in ministry. So it's important that we recognize what ministry is, what it is not as well, and, and that we all endeavor to engage in our part because the Great Commission, which we'll be looking at on Sunday during our, our time for Mission Sunday, the Great Commission is to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them and instructing them in the things that Jesus both said and did. And so Paul is going to give us the background for what it means to be in ministry tonight. Would you join me and let's pray and we'll dig in here at verse 7. Father, thank you for giving us so richly from the life of the Apostle Paul these keys to ministry. Lord, you could take these verses and, and use them as a course on what ministry really looks like. And so, God, we pray that you'd minister to us through these words and that, God, we'd take them to heart and be looking for those places where we can join you in what you're already doing. And so bless us as we study. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Verse 7, Romans chapter 15, And therefore receive one another, just as Christ also received us. Part of the ministry is making sure that you're receiving people. You know, ministry is about people. You don't often think of it, but ministry is about people. It's not about buildings. It's not about cars. It's not about denominations. It's not about ministry styles. It's not about pews versus chairs. It's not about whether you have lights or don't have lights. It's not about an electric guitar versus uh, a stand-up fiddle. Uh, it is about nothing. Ministry at its core is about us taking the gospel to people and then causing them to grow. And so the Apostle Paul begins by saying, therefore receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Everything we do, all that we say, all that we are, is to be to the glory of God and only to the glory of God. One of the great problems that we face in our world today in church, in ministry, in, in what we would call professional ministry is what I call the cult of personality. Ministry is built on a person. Ministry is built on a pastor. Ministry that basically glorify a style of ministry or ministries that actually take away from the glory of God and put that on a man or on a movement. All ministry is done for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to glorify God. That's it. We need to not lose sight of that, because when we do, we start to put our fo focus towards things that are either not important to God at all, or actually an, an antithetical to what he wants to accomplish. In other words, they are the wrong thing to do. No ministry should be built on a man. Every ministry should be built on Jesus Christ to the glory of God the Father. And now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant. And that word in that case, there are going to be three of them used in this remaining portion of what we call chapter 15. There will be three Greek words. This one happens to mean servant where it says minister. But minister to the circumcision for the truth of God. Jesus Christ, when he went into ministry, if you want to look at it that way, when he went from being this unknown person who was in the region of Galilee, the son of Joseph, born from this immaculate conception to Mary, this man that everybody knew as Jesus of Nazareth, when he initially launched out into ministry, it was to exactly one people group. It was to the Jews. 
Jesus spent very little time, and as far as the scriptures say, none of it intentionally, at least initially, seeking out Gentiles. He sought to minister to the Jewish people because the gospel was supposed to go to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And so because that's a truth of Scripture and Jesus Christ is God, he ministers to the Jewish people to confirm the promises made to, and you can see it here, it's actually described, to the fathers. The fathers of the Jewish people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were given tremendous promises. We're beginning to get to those in the book of Genesis. The first one will be the covenant made with Noah, followed by the covenant made to Abraham, followed by the covenant made to David. There are these incredible covenants that were made exclusively to the Jewish people that we as believers in Christ Jesus, by faith, have inherited some of the promises, but we have not inherited Jewishness. There's still a promise to them the promise of Abraham that applies to them very specifically. And so Jesus begins to unfold those things initially in his ministry, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. And he goes on now to quote three Old Testament passages. The first one is Psalm 18, 49, then Deuteronomy 32, 43, and then Isaiah eleven ten. So this is an Old Testament picture of the grace of God at work, and it's being quoted by Jesus in New Testament times. For this reason I will confess among you the Gentiles and sing your name. And again he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he will rise to reign over the Gentiles, and in him the Gentiles will have hope. Can I tell you that our Messiah, our King, our Lord Jesus is a Jew. And in fact, we have a tremendous debt to the Jewish people because they gave us two very important things. Without the Jewish people, there would be no Bible. We would have no word. They are the ones that compiled it. They are the ones that constructed it. They are the ones that kept it. They are the ones that faithfully transmitted it. We have the Bible as we know it almost entirely due to the Jewish people. And of course, the other one's easy. His name is Jesus. Jesus is Jewish. And so this root of Jesse, remember this is of the line of David, David, right? Jesse's kind of wimpy son, the one that everybody passed over, the one that was the lunch boy when they were getting ready to fight the battle. There uh, does the unbelievable Philistines are on one side of the canyon and the Jewish people are on the other. They're on these opposing hillsides that are shouting back and forth. There was a stump of the root of Jesse, the prophet Isaiah said. This one that would come up out of, his, out of what seems to be a dead tree. Growing up and having business in Fallbrook for a, quite a long time, it's the avocado capital of the world. One thing that you almost could always count on is there was never such a thing as a dead avocado tree. You could cut them almost completely down. And out of that root stalk, all of a sudden there'd be little shoots coming up out of it. And before you know it, here comes another tree. Out of the dead stump of Jesse would come Messiah the King. It's a messianic passage. It's talking specifically about Jesus because Jesus from Jesse is the lineage of David, and David is a forebear of none other than Jesus himself. Long way around, isn't it? Looks like it's dead, looks like it's not going to happen. Verse 13, And now may God, the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We'll continue on as we go through this. We're actually going to finish the chapter tonight. You see, believe it or not, you've all been called into ministry. And so as you look at these words that are used for minister or to do ministry, uh, they mean several different things. But high on the list in this one word there in verse 16, it's only used this one place in the entire New Testament. It is only used here. means to render or to give priestly service. And for those of you that are students of the Bible, you know that we as believers are called priests unto the Most High God. 
We who are men happen to be also priests of our own home. We've been given a role to be a person who stands between God and man. And that's a good definition for ministry. We stand between God and men. We who know the Lord, who've been with the Lord, have believed on Jesus Christ, received him by faith, actually have the beautiful ministry of taking that truth and going from God to men. We call it the gospel, don't we? The good news. You see, to be a minister is to take the gospel that came from God, is about the Lord Jesus Christ, and present it to other people. That's all it is. Can I tell you there's a lot of different ways to do that? You can do that with cookies. You're all sitting there thinking, he's crazy, he's hungry. No, you can do that with cookies. We actually have a ministry here at this church where we take thousands of cookies down to the United States Marine Corps recruits at Camp Pendleton. And you'd be surprised how many hundreds of men have come to faith in Christ over cookies. Quickest way to a man's heart through his stomach, ladies. You want to know how to get there? Just serve a good dinner. No, it opens the door, doesn't it? Can I tell you, we have ministry to people who are shut-ins and indigents, people who can't get around, people who just need a ride from one place to another. That is ministry. We're standing between God and men by meeting that need. You see, sometimes we think of ministry as it's doing what I'm doing right now, which is teaching a Bible study, maybe preaching, pastoring. But the word pastor at its root actually also comes from these words, And it ultimately means a servant. It means a shepherd. It means one who distributes what has already been given to him or her. You see, I can't give you something that God hasn't first given me. And so in that priestly duty, I've gone to God to get from God so I can give to you. That's all it is. So you can serve God. You can be a minister for the Lord in a lot of different ways. Don't limit what the Lord can do by confining it to full-time pastoral ministry. A vast majority of all the ministry that gets done in this world is not done by full-time pastoral ministers. It's done by people just like you who simply share the gospel simply with somebody who lives next door to them. That is ministry. Don't forget it. Those cookies to the Marines, that's ministry. Making sure these pews are cleaned and the communion cups are taken out of them after a communion service, ministry. Making sure the light bulbs are in the fixtures, ministry. Making sure the sound actually works. There's a lot of technology back there. If you've never actually stopped at the soundboard and looked at it, there's a lot of buttons and knobs. Somebody better have that ministry. Otherwise, what I'm going to be saying right now, you're not going to be hearing There's a lot of ways to minister. The question is, are you going to take up the call to ministry yourself? Please, I beg you, don't leave it all to me or to the pastoral staff here at the church. We've all been called into ministry. The only question is where and what, but you've been called. There's a beautiful progression in these verses, and I want you to see it. First, the Jews, as we see this, glorify God among the Gentiles. They're in verse 9. Then they glorify God with the Jews in verse 10. And then the Jews and the Gentiles together praise God. And then finally, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, by the time we get to verse 12, will reign over all of us. And so ultimately, it's among us, it's with us, it's together, and ultimately there's one Lord. That's why Paul would write there in Ephesians 4 that there's one Lord. And he's Lord of all of us. That's why God hates division, by the way. One of the key things that Paul does in, in dealing with the church at Corinth is to talk about the things that divided them and how it grieves the heart of God. So as you look at Jesus' ministry to the Gentiles, let's pick up in verse 14. It's a beautiful picture. And it says there, 
And now I myself am confident among you, brethren, that you are also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. Now, that, that means to give a strong exhortation, to speak truth, difficult truth, hard truth into someone's life while still being loving. Be careful about taking up the gift of admonishment because it's actually not just being a jerk for Jesus. And the reason I say that is a lot of people think that the gift of admonishing someone is you just really let them have it. No, the gift of admonishment is taking something that's very difficult and wrapping it and packing it in love and giving it to someone in such a way that they still understand it's serious, but that God still loves them. They were able to do that. You, you see, someone who really is able to minister like Paul did to the Gentiles, you have to be able to tell people the truth in love. You can't just tell them the truth, because the truth can be brutal if you leave the love out of it. And if you leave the truth out of it, then it's a lie. So you need to be able to tell people the truth in, in love, and that was one thing that Paul was able to do, and we're really going to see that. Uh, as we dig into 1 Corinthians specifically. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. There are times in our ministry experience that we need to be bold. And there are times when we can throttle it back a little bit and absolutely the Holy Spirit can use both. I've watched in my own life to where, you know, man, I really need to just let this guy have it. You know, sometimes men come into my office and you can see the look in their eyes. It's like, oh no, my wife drug me in here. I'm going to be beat to a pulp. Spiritually, of course. But you know, it's some of those times when the best thing I can do is just love on them. They already know what the problem is. But there are also times when they come in and they look me in the eye and they're sizing me up. They're, they're looking to see if they can pull one over on Pastor Jeff. And to those guys, sometimes they get a little more fight than they're bargaining for. Have to speak a little more boldly while still maintaining love. There's a place for both. The Apostle Paul, as he ministered to the Gentiles, was able to have that tremendous balance. That I might be a minister, notice this, of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You see, at this point in time, the Gentiles had not yet been given, in essence, the, 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 the full gospel message. And we'll equate this to the book of Acts. The Gentiles had part of the message. It was leaking out a little bit. But that boldness that the Apostle Paul had in his ministry to the Gentiles, he's packaging it in a way that the Gentiles could receive it. Now, this is, this is God with a sense of humor. Now, think about who this is that's writing this letter, the letter to the church at Rome. Think about who that is. Go back to our beginning. This is the Pharisee Saul of Tarsus a member of the Sanhedrin, the law court of Israel. This is a man whose former job was to hunt down Christians, persecute them, and bring them in chains so that they could be tried and found guilty and put to death. And where does God send him? Sends him to the very people he had been persecuting. He himself is a Jew. So don't be surprised if God puts you in a place where you're really not comfortable. Don't be surprised if the Lord does a work in your life by taking you out of your comfort zone. You see, the Apostle Paul would have been super comfortable ministering to Jews, wouldn't he? And where does God send him? To people he has absolutely nothing in common with. And here's what normally happens. Every preconception, everything you think you know, all of those gifts that you might be tempted to rely on are gone. They're out the window. It's one of the reasons I love the mission field. 
Because what works here in South Bay isn't really going to work in the foothills of the Andes. You know, you, you tell cultural stories the way we live our lives here in Southern California, and the rest of the world kind of looks at you like, what? You talk to them about Dodgers, and they think it's some kind of food. You know, they just don't get it. You have to get out of your comfort zone. You have to kind of forget what you think you already know. And you need to become all things to all men. That you might win some. That the gospel would go forward. That's the goal. That's ministry. And you know what? It doesn't always work out the way you think it's going to work out. Again, part of the beauty of it because it's going to be sanctified ultimately by the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's not at work in it, you're on a failed mission to begin with. And therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. Notice who he's glorying in. Is he glorying in the Apostle Paul? No. Is he glorying in his Jewishness? No. Is he glorying in his knowledge of the first five books, what we would call uh, the Pentateuch, what he would have called the Torah? No. His training in all things of Jewish law, studying under Gamaliel, one of the most famous rabbis of all time, if not the most famous rabbi of all time? No. He's glorying in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, let us endeavor always to just simply glory in Jesus. To give Him the glory, to honor Him, to make sure that nothing points to us, that everything we do and everything we say points people to Jesus. Because He saves, He transforms, He renews, He washes, He cleanses, He forgives. He is the one who is able. I am not able. This church is not able. Jesus alone is able. We need to make ministry about Jesus and for his glory. It's not about our style of ministry. It's about Christ alone. We sung it tonight, our cor cornerstone, amen? He is the cornerstone. Beautiful song, by the way, because it pictures the very thing that the Jewish people would have understood so well. Whatever you do to the cornerstone, that sets the rest of the building. If you're in here and you're a block mason, you know exactly what this is. When you lay out the foundation, if that first block is not in exactly the right place, nothing else will work the way it's supposed to work. It's the foundation that matters. The foundation on which we stand as a church is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation of all ministry. For I will not dare to speak of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me, in word or in deed, to make the Gentiles a being. He says, look, if, if it wasn't from Jesus, I'm not even going to talk about it. And that's a paraphrase, but it's an accurate one. If it's not Jesus, it's not worth talking about. And it doesn't mean, and please don't misunderstand what's being said here, don't get in the habit of, well, I know it's all about Jesus, so I'm not going to actually compliment anyone ever. That's not what's being said here. It's nice to tell someone, you know, that was really wonderful worship or the message really ministered to my heart. But don't be surprised if someone says to you, it, it was from Jesus. Because that's who deserves the glory. That's the one who should really get the praise. After all, we are praising him and he is the word. Don't forget what John 1 plainly declares. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and by the time you get to verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Amen? Amen. So what we're reading is Jesus. We're reading Jesus. Ministries about him, for him, accomplished through him, and he says, in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem, around Arilicum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Notice it's the gospel of Christ. It wasn't a ministry style. It wasn't what Paul thought. It wasn't about his latest and greatest book. 
And again, I'm not against books. I have thousands of them. The reason I'm saying that is it's easy to get off onto other things. We need to always bring it back to Jesus. Always bring it back to Jesus, family. We want to make sure it comes back to Jesus. And the reason I'm saying this is so very often we think that church, we think that ministry is about something else. It's about a bigger building or it's about, you know, simply bringing in more people or raising more money or, or, or accomplishing some task or goal. And while all those things can be used to point people to Jesus, we need to make sure that the only reason we're doing those things is to point people to Jesus. We have air conditioning in here to point people to Jesus. Did you know that? You know why? Because none of you are listening if you're unconscious. So on a hot day, if it were 110 in here, you're all going to be, your eyes will be rolled back in your head, we'll be calling EMS, you'll all be getting carted out from heat stroke. So the air conditioning is in this building to point people to Jesus. It provides an atmosphere. The reason that we did the stage remodel is to point people to Jesus. It's so we have a larger space, a more versatile space to point people to Jesus so we can use some really high definition images as opposed to little tiny squinty things that we used to have. So it's just to point people to Jesus. Word, deed, signs, wonders, power, so that no matter where you are, Jerusalem, Aurelicum, and so I've made it my aim to preach the gospel But not where Christ was already named. Notice this. He, he didn't go someplace where Jesus was already being preached. He went someplace where Jesus wasn't being preached yet. I actually had a... They don't know that I know, but actually had a couple of pastors that showed up a few weeks ago that wanted to meet with me. Well, it's because they wanted to open up a church about two blocks down the street. Because they drive by on Sunday, man, there's a lot of cars in the parking lot, so this must be a hot area for preaching Jesus. And so they were asking me, you know, well, how did you get the permits and all, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I finally just asked them, I said, so you guys want to open up a church? You should have seen their face. Personally, I don't care if there's a church on every corner and in between. It doesn't matter to me as long as they preach Christ. The sheep are his. You put sheep into the pasture that he wants them into. If he's not doing that, then I really don't want to be a part anyway. Not where others have already been. But as it, uh, thus I should build on another man's found foundation. And that, that's the picture. You know, look. You've been called into ministry not to shift sheep from one pasture to another. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not, not to try and get people to go to a specific place, but rather to get them to know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to grow in Christ so that they're better sheep. But as it is written, to him who was not announced, they shall see, and to those who have not heard, they, they will understand and for this reason, I've been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire to, these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. That's a long journey. I don't know whether you've thought about it or not, but that's 1,400 miles between Jerusalem and Rome. And it's nearly another 1,800 to Spain. So the Apostle Paul wasn't afraid to cut some new territory. Go someplace where somebody wasn't already ministering. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you if first I may enjoy your company for a while. You know, one of the glories of being in the mission field is this very thing. You know, Connie and I have 
friends, many of us here in this church who've been in the mission field for a while, we have friends all over the world. And it's almost like you never left. When I show up in these places that I've been ministering for a very long time and see people that I've been ministering with for a very long time, it's that joy. It's sitting down in a coffee shop and having a cup of coffee and just, you know, what's been going on in your life? We call it relational ministry because that's what Jesus did. Jesus wasn't about a promotion of a brand. Jesus was about building relationship with people so that they would not only come to know him, but follow him and grow in him. You do that by gaining people's trust, getting their care and their concern, engaging them in life wherever they are. And that is what we see in the Apostle Paul. And so to that end, he gives us in this passage five characteristics of a very fruitful ministry. Notice what they are. The first thing we see, and we saw that in verses 14 and 15, was received by grace. Every bit of ministry that you will ever do, whether it's to your own children, your own spouse, or as a Sunday school teacher, or as a janitor, or as someone who simply preaches Christ in the workplace, simply as someone who maybe endeavors to be in a full-time pastoral ministry, whatever it is, every bit of ministry is always and only by grace. God's unmerited favor that he uses people to do things for him. I don't know that there's anything that's a bigger picture of grace beyond our own personal salvation than God ever using anyone. Because I can tell you what happens when God uses me. He's not getting a bargain. He's got to work with all those things that are me. My personality, my silly jokes, my upbringing, all of my problems, everything that I've ever experienced in life. He doesn't just erase your mind and put you into ministry. He doesn't erase your life experience. He works with all those things. So every bit of ministry that Paul engaged in, and remember who he was, This is a man who persecuted Christians, Gentile Christians. If that's not the grace of God at work in somebody's life, that that man is going to be called now to minister to the very persons that he persecuted. I don't know what it is. Ministry is by grace. Ministry is through grace. Ministry in that sense is for grace. And ministry should exemplify grace. It's all about grace. God's unmerited favor. Christ's riches that have been given to us. It was centered in the gospel there in verse 16. Because he uses that word that I shared with you that is for priestly service. It's the work of standing between God and men. The reason that we're here tonight is hopefully to teach and preach and reach so that you can go do the work of the ministry. Do you know that the book of Ephesians says that I am supposed to prepare you, you, as in all of you, for the work of the ministry. That's part of my job. Not prepare me so that I go do all of it, or the staff here at the church so they do all of it. I'm supposed to prepare you for the work of the ministry. How can that be? It's very simple. It's found here in this point. It's about the gospel. You now live gospel lives. You're walking, talking, living, breathing people who have the gospel alive in your own life and you can share it. It's a beautiful picture of ministry. This is how Paul ministered to a group that he shouldn't have been able to minister to, to Gentiles. The third thing, it was all done for God's glory. As I shared with you, so important. Now, now notice this. Paul had some reasons to glory in his own self, did he not? Think about the Apostle Paul. If you were with us in our study in the book of Acts that we did on Sunday nights, the Apostle Paul went through hell to minister to the Gentiles. And I mean that quite literally. Literally. He literally was battling demons. He, he, he's, 
He's hanging out with people who are possessed. He's stoned. He's shipwrecked. He's left for dead. He's thrown outside the city walls. The dude suffered. So in our modern day and time, the first thing we do is we write a book, Suffering for Jesus. Right? Paul didn't write about that. He said, I count not my own life dear. That's how he viewed it. If I had croaked in the service to the king, it would have been a great thing. He so believed what he's teaching here, that ministry is for the Lord, it's for his glory, that if he died in the process, then the right message got across. God's glory alone. That's why he could write to the church at Colossae there in, first, in the first chapter of Colossians, there in verse 18, that in all things Christ might be preeminent. No other thing. And I, and I can imagine the Apostle Paul when you met him, and what we know about him largely comes from extra-biblical writings, historians first, first century, Cyril and Tertullian and these guys who were historians wrote what they knew to be oral tradition about Paul. Paul was a fairly short guy, had eye problems. He was not pleasant to look at. It wasn't like anybody goes, man, that, let's just go hang out with Paul because Paul's cool. No, nobody would have invited Paul to the party so that you know all the beautiful people would come. And so when you talk to Paul, the only thing you remembered was Jesus. That's all you would have got. When he left, you would have been left with the fragrance of Christ. A fourth thing. It was done by God's power. Look, nothing that we do is in our own strength. If it is, you're going to run out of strength. But if it's in God's power, by the Holy Spirit, then everything is possible. For with God, all things are possible. Amen? But without Him, nothing is possible. Get the picture? So we want Him to be the center so we can have the power we need to accomplish what He sent us for. This is a picture of ministry. That's why people whom you would think would be a failure at ministry are successful. Because it's not about them, it's about God. It's about His power working through their lives. I have watched guys become pastors that you look at them and go, well, you know, if we needed somebody to be, you know, like a janitor, they probably could do that. And that's not bashing anyone who is in janitorial service. That's simply saying that when you look at that person, you go, I'm not seeing the gift of a pastor there. And yet, because of their heart to serve the Lord, their desire to be used of the Lord, their desire to glorify God, and their desire to rest and trust in His power, I have seen the most unlikely people be used mightily and powerfully for the Lord. So don't think he can't use you. Maybe, maybe you're here and you think you're, you know, your, your best use of your gifts is just simply as, a, as an engineer or maybe it's a teacher. Or maybe you stay at home with your children. You're a great mom. God can still use great moms for his glory. And does. And in fact, I'm not so sure that that isn't the highest calling many of you ladies will ever have. Is raising your children in Christ, making sure the home is stable so that your children know that God loves them. And you do too. That's ministry. But it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to do that as well. It's not easy. And look, let me be blunt with you. Miracles don't ever save anyone. Signs and wonders save no one. Matter of fact, Jesus himself said, in that day, some will say, Lord, Lord. 
And they will say, look, I moved mountains for you, God. And he's going to say, depart, I never knew you. You see, you can do miraculous things for the wrong reason. The question is, are you going to do those miraculous things for the right reason? Because God wants to use signs and wonders only if they draw people to Jesus. Not to you, not to me, not to a church. To Jesus. And to that end, Paul lived his life 24-7, 365. It's just about the Lord. And all of this was according to God's plan. Notice there in verses 20 to 24 what it says. He, he followed God's plan meticulously. In fact, so much so that he wanted to go see these very people, but he did not go. He said, I'm going to make sure that I'm plowing new ground. I, I, I'm going where nobody's been yet. And one of the things that we love about the Apostle Paul, that I personally love about his life, was he finished what he started. He ran the race well. Please don't just be a starter. I see a lot of starters. Finishers are harder to come by. Be a starter and a finisher. God has a plan for your life, and he has a beginning, and he's got an end to it. And you want the beginning, and you also want the end, and you want everything in between. Be a starter and a finisher. The next thing we see is his ministry to the Jewish people. But now I'm going to Jerusalem, it says in verse 25, to minister to the saints, for it it pleased those from Macedonia and Acacia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who were in Jerusalem. Now remember, these are Gentiles taking up a collection for Jewish believers in Jerusalem. Macedonia was the heart of the Greek Empire. It was now ruled by Rome, but it was still heavily influenced by the Greeks. We'll see as we get into the book of 1 Corinthians, this this city that's on the Isthmus, not very far from Athens. These people cared because God put that care in their heart, and so now they're ministering to the Jews. It pleased them indeed, for they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of spiritual things, their duty also is to minister to them in material things. Brothers and sisters, it is the reason why anti-Semitism and and all of its offspring, the insanity of what happens in the UN condemning Israel almost on a weekly basis, this little tiny nation, scantly nine million people that live inside of its borders that's not even the size of New Jersey, one-third the size of San Bernardino County here in our own state. It would occupy so much time, draw so much ire from the world. The reason, I, I, don't, I don't know that you can actually be a real Bible-believing Christian and not love Israel. I don't even know how you do that. And you certainly can't buy into some hideous thing like BDS. Boycott, divest, and sanction. We are debtors to Israel. We are debtors to the Jewish people. We will always be debtors to the Jewish people. We will never not be debtors to the Jewish people. And the whole function of the very last days is to see to it that the Jewish people come to faith in Messiah. So we need to be really careful and make sure that we love Israel, love the Jewish people. Notice what it goes on to say, and therefore, when I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, he's taking a gift, a collection that's taken up in Greek Macedonia, and he's taken it about 800 miles south to Jerusalem. I shall go by the way of you to Spain. He's going to go drop this gift off and then travel that 1,400 miles to Rome and then across all the way to Spain. 
But I know that when you come, and I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ, that through the love of the Spirit, that you thrive, strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. Paul was going back to hostile territory. Remember, they considered him a traitor. He wasn't afraid to go where he was not welcome. And that my service in Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God, that you may be refreshed together, and that we may be refreshed together uh, with you. And now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. You see this collection that's being detailed. We're actually going to get to it in 2 Corinthians. But Paul is in this difficult place. He, he's going to go do something that's going to be hard for him. But he looked at that offering that he's taking back to Jerusalem as a debt. He said, I have to do this. I need to do this. And I think we need to look at it the same way. As I said, we have, because of the Jewish people, preserved for us the Word of God. One of the things that happens when you travel to, to Israel, and though we've postponed our trip until 2019, primarily because of sign-ups, when you travel, it becomes very clear without the Jewish people, we wouldn't have a Bible when you sit there at Qumran and you realize that inside of those jars stored in all those caves scattered all over those hills that there's not a stitch of life anywhere. There aren't even weeds in that area next to the Dead Sea. Nothing. But there are the Essenes. This incredibly harsh environment collecting rainwater in a canyon over a mile away and funneling it by these little rock aqueducts into cisterns on a rocky outcrop overlooking a sea that is so salty that nothing can live in it. They spent almost 300 years transcribing every single bit of what we call the Old Testament except for the book of Ruth. We have a copy of every one of them all at least 140, some of them as much as 212 years older than the birth of Christ. So the whole Old Testament, we have portions at least of all of it, thanks to the Jewish people. Now imagine that the authors of the New Testament are all, guess what? They're Jewish. By and large. We're not sure of the writers of, writer of Hebrews. We kind of are a little uncertain maybe on Dr. Luke. And Jesus, he's a Jew. Celebrated the feast days. We just saw him on Sunday morning go to the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. We have a debt. We need to make sure that we take that seriously. As we wrap this up tonight, six final things that we can glean from this passage. We see the Apostle Paul receiving God's providential care. Do you believe in God's providence for your life? Do you believe in God's providential care for your life? I hope you do. The Apostle Paul did. He had to. Because he is going back to a hostile environment in Jerusalem where he is most likely going to be beaten and or imprisoned or killed. Remember, he's already spent more than two years in prison in Caesarea Maritima. Constantly harassed, interrogated, put on trial, and he finally gets loose only, only to be taken to Rome, ultimately where he will eventually die. Do you believe in God's providential care for your life. He's watching over you all day, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Do you believe that? Because you should. Because if he's not, you have a lot of reasons to be very fearful every moment of every day. 
Because if God doesn't have it, nobody does. Our government doesn't have it. Amen? It doesn't matter what level you're talking about. Local, state, federal. It's not like they're sitting there thinking about all of us. For the most part, they're thinking about how do they keep their position in government. And again, I realize that there are some that are not. But the whole system isn't exactly people-friendly, is it? It's government-friendly. It's self-promoting. It's self-aggrandizing. It's self-rewards. How would you like to have a job where you can vote to give yourself a raise? You know what I'm saying? Man, if God doesn't have his hand on us, we're all doomed. Here's the good news. God has his hand on all of us. He's not going to drop you. He didn't forget where you are. Rest and trust in his providential care. If you're a minister of the gospel, which you all are, God's got you. In this we see there in verses 23 and 24, some personal planning. The Apostle Paul does not go off half-loaded. He realizes everything that's at stake. He makes proper plans. It's okay to plan as a Christian. Did you know that? You see, you kind of have two opposing views. You have the Christians that you believe, well, God will take care of it, man. I can tell you, I've checked to see if our flights are on time for Peru. I'm not just going to show up at the airport. Well, I hope so. I'm actually going to take my passport. I'm not going to get to there, you know, and we'll all be standing in line. Well, well, you know, God's going to cover me not bringing my passport. No, he's not. He's going to send you home. You're going to look like an idiot. It's okay to plan. You should plan. When we set out to do a project, we count the cost before we start it so that we have enough to finish it. That's called planning. Paul planned personally, and so should we. Now, submit those plans to the Lord and go where he goes and do what he says to do, but make some plans. Just make sure you talk to Jesus about them before, make sure you talk to him about during, and make sure that you commit the whole thing to him while it's happening, and when you get done, give him the glory. Amen? A third thing. Paul set some priorities. He said, look, I'm going to Jerusalem first, and when I get done, I'm going to come back and see you on my way to Spain. That's priorities. He said, I need to go do this because I'm in debt to the church in Jerusalem. Without them, I would have died. And so he set some priorities. Set some priorities in your life. Pick out some things that you know God wants you to do first and do them. Maybe it's just getting your marriage squared away. Maybe you got some things to do where God just wants you to spend some time studying. For many of us, it's like, man, how about mapping out some devotional time for the Lord? That's a priority. It should be. Read through the Bible this year. Set some priorities. A fourth thing. Knowing, it says there in verse 29, when I come, that I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. You know, when you do things God's way, He takes care of you. It's one of the things about our, our financial giving. That's why, that's why it is so essential for the child of God to be actively engaged in giving towards the work of the ministry. If you want God's blessing, you need to bless Him. If you want to be prosperous, you need to do things His way. Too many people wander around going, well, I want God to bless me, and then I'll think about blessing him. It doesn't work that way. You be faithful. If you want spiritual prosperity, and I'm not preaching health, wealth, and prosperity here. I'm preaching exactly what Malachi chapter 3 says. If you want the destroyer kept from your door, then make sure you're giving your first fruits to God. Paul did that. And he could count on the blessings of God because he had been faithful. We see in Paul a heartfelt purpose. And I love this. I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. He's saying, man, this is something that burns within me. It's part of who I am. It's part of my DNA, we would say. This is, this is who I am by Christ. You know, we, we talk about 
principles that guide us or guiding principles. Paul's guiding principle was glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in everything. That was his heartfelt purpose. That was his devotion. That was his definition. And finally, we see this incredible prayer life. A powerful prayer life. And quite honestly, maybe, maybe a cardinal characteristic of the person who's really being used of the Lord is someone who actually talks to God. In my time in ministry, I've had a chance to talk to an awful lot of young people. And you'd be surprised how many of them not only don't pray, but they don't even believe in praying. And now I'm going to tell you why. Because their parents never pray with them. Moms and dads, make prayer a priority in your home. If you want the railroad tracks of, as Watchman Nee wisely said, of the power and the glory of the Lord to lead to something that you are concerned about, you set them with prayer. If you want God's Holy Spirit locomotive to drag those resources necessary for that thing in your life, then you need to tell Him where it is that you would like that to go. Too often, we as the body of Christ, we just kind of like, well, whatever, Lord. And though we might not actually say it that way, by the way we pray, that is exactly what we're saying. Because we don't war, as Paul said here. We don't wrestle. We don't agonize. The actual word that he uses here for his prayer life is he agonizes over his prayer life. It's like, I, I got to go to battle in prayer. If you haven't seen it, watch War Room. Great movie. Why? Because it says exactly what I am saying right now. Go to war. Pray as if your life depends on it. Pray as if the life of this church depends on it. And let me ask you a question. If we got in this church what you have asked for from the Lord, what would this church look like? What would it look like? Would we be overflowing with blessing? Would we have countless thousands of people coming to faith in Christ? Would, would we have missionaries in thousands of places instead of hundreds of places because you prayed it in? Or would we have less than we have now? And again, this is not a chastisement. It's a challenge. It's a challenge to you. War in prayer. Paul did. I think in many ways a lot like Jesus. He sweat great drops of blood. He prayed that way. He warred in prayer. That's how you have a powerful prayer life. He uses actually the word agnizomai. means to agonize. With all prayer, Paul said there in Ephesians 6, that great passage where we, we always go for the armor of God. But remember what it says there. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age. Against hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. You better be agonizing against that group. Because if you're just going, well... You know, I hope I don't get a demon today. You're going to get boot kicked through the goalpost of life. You need to be doing some agonizing. Some begging God. Warring. Because prayer is very often a battle. Amen? Anybody here ever found out that this moment you go to pray... The first thing that happens is you can think about the most ridiculous, absurd, dumb things on the face of the earth, instantaneous. You make up in your heart, and mind, I'm going to spend some time in prayer. And what happens? The phone rings, your watch goes off, your cell phone explodes, your kids get in detention in school, 
the dog runs away. I won't even talk about cats because they're demonic already. <laughs> At least mine is. If you've seen my Instagram post, you know what I'm saying. And that's when I'm being nice to her. She's crazy. All right, so cats are sort of nice sometimes. But you know what I'm saying. You go to pray and what happens? Your whole world comes unglued. Why? Because prayer changes stuff. God's actually listening. And He cares. War. Have a powerful prayer life. And finally, He just ends with the benediction. And now the peace of God be with you all. Isn't that the result of our salvation? He's the Prince of Peace, isn't he? And without him in our lives, we do not have peace. At least not peace with God. You might have circumstantial peace. You may have an absence of conflict. You may not have a full-blown war in your home. But the peace of God comes through peace with God. And that comes from knowing him. Amen? Amen? Going to invite the worship team back up. We're just simply going to close in prayer. A little long because we had a long passage of Scripture tonight. But we'll close in worship. But let's pray. Would you stand with me? Father God in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Lord, I personally thank you for saving my soul. Or I pray that you'd forgive me those times when I'm less than faithful, Lord, to you. And I pray that we would have a, a sense of urgency about the gospel. God, would we as a church remember we're all in ministry? Father, would we have a keen eye on your providential care? Lord, would we continue to plan personally for the things that you have for us? We ask, Lord, that you help us to have the right priorities in everything that we do. Lord, from the moment we get up to the moment we put our head on the pillow. Lord, we want to be spiritually prosperous. In order to do that, we have to give you everything that we have. And so help us to do that. Lord, we pray that we'd have a deep aching in our heart for your things. Heartfelt purpose. Lord, make us prayer warriors. Lord, let us beseech you for our children, for our families, for our communities, for our state, for our nation, for our world. Lord, let us lift up those who govern over us. God, you put them there. Sometimes we complain, but we don't actually ask you to change the situation. Help us to be prayer warriors. And Lord, we thank you for that peace that surpasses our own human understanding and guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We bless your name. Thank you for calling us into ministry. And we ask this in the precious, the wonderful, glorious name, the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.